That's actually the very first Borders bookstore founded here in 1971 by gay couple Tom and Lewis Border. Have a good look while you can. They're not going to be around much longer thanks to the invention of the iPad. Zoom out to footage being played on iPad. I miss books already. Rest in peace Borders. Your dead bark smelling aisles. Your little coffee shops where you can read books without buying them. And your rows of iPads. Anyway, that's the Michigan Theatre, I, I think. Uh. I feel like I've been a little um, sarcastically negative lately. So I've brought us to Ann Arbor, Michigan. Ann Arbor, Michigan. The greatest place in America. And like this Coca-Cola, it is very American. Um, I was gonna have a sip of this, you know, and do like the advertisement thing, Americana, but um, doesn't seem to open. I don't think this is a twist top. Okay. Um. Ann Arbor, as American as Starbucks. It's funny I should bring up Starbucks. Hilarious actually, because. The first Starbucks ever was first built here. Let's go have a look at it. Ann Arbor, Michigan, the birth of elaborateness in relation to coffee. From a true poem by Michael Trilling and Sean McKinnon. The tale of Starbucks's beginnings grow not from corporate Seattle, but from down in the murky depths of the Huron River and a mermaid's tail. The year was 1902, then a semicircle made it 1903, then all of a sudden, a four. In this 1904, a young single mermaid by the name of Annabelle Harbour was trying to enroll at the University of Michigan's Law School, located in the town known, at the time, as Detroit 2, Judgment Day. But, being a creature of the river, the university did not accept her people's currency. Seashell dollars, by the seashore even though 100 Huron River shells parodied one penny. That's right. Alone and rejected, Anne focused on the river's second valuable resource commodity, water. Her only hope was to 
sell fresh hot and cold Huron River water by the roadside. It was there that she met Sir Baxter Starlington III, Rise of the Machines. Baxter was born into the wealthy Starlington Coffee Bean family. You've heard of them. Baxter was grind out into the best schools coffee beans could offer, Michigan Law School. There it is right there. Yet, Baxter was kicked out of the school for leaking information about a handful of professors misappropriating funds to a secretive cloak and dagger type off-campus society. But more about that later. Too embarrassed to go back to his parents, who not only founded the secret initiative, it turns out, but supplied the coffee for their rituals. Baxter sold whole coffee beans by the roadside to save enough money to sue the pants off the school for wrongful expulsion under the 28th Amendment of the United States Constitution regarding whistleblowing. Anne and Baxter met and joined forces. The two found out they had a lot in common. Both sold almost worthless things by the side of the road and both had a vendetta against Michigan Law School and both had recently lost someone they had loved. Anne used to have a boyfriend centaur named Buck, but Buck was assassinated for fixing the Kentucky Derby by entering himself into the race and winning it. The proper horses union, or PHU, were understandably cross and ironically bucked him to death. Baxter, on the other hand, lost the love of his life to a perplexion of eventful devastations. While backpacking through Europe, Baxter's fiance, Natasha Lawrence, fell ill with a case, a rare case of the bubonic plague that had laid dormant in the out of the way village, lost bubonical death pit of black sorrow keep out, population minus 28. His fiance tragically died. Because he could not be without her, Baxter buried Tash in a Bavarian cemetery after hearing local legends of the dead returning from there. Baxter desperately waited for the Bavarian cemetery to do its thing, hoping Tash would come back to life. She did, but tragically she could only speak Bavarian. The language barrier was too much for Baxter and he could no longer be with her. Her appetite for brains also stuck in the mud of love. Talking about old flames right off the bat is a good move, and these tales of woe brought Baxter and Anne together. With Anne's unlimited access to cold and hot Huron River water, and Baxter's access to cheap coffee beans, they were able to create a delicious cup of coffee for almost nothing. The pair then sold the cheap coffee at outrageous prices to the rich, snooty law students, who needed the caffeine to study for midterms. A perfect business plan, if you will. They opened their first store and called it Star, after Baxter's surname and Buck, in honor of Anne's late centaur boyfriend. Naming joint businesses after old flames isn't as recommended as bringing them up in conversation, but it was 1904, where anything goes. They soon sued the school and the town with all the lawyers they had, who were working for cups of coffee. In the settlement, the town was to be renamed after Anne, but the sign maker accidentally named the town Ann Arbor instead of Harbor, due to the jitters from excess amounts of caffeine. Starbucks had now become the place to be for the most snooty college students you could imagine. And Anne and Baxter soon married and had a daughter. They named Venti, who was half mermaid and half human, resulting in two tails in place of legs. They later made Venti the poster child for the company after she won the Miss America pageant. See crown on logo. Resulting in more publicity, and as they say, any publicity is good publicity. The second store opened in Seattle's Pike Place, but that's another story.
Inside this red brick building is a secret. With its painted on windows and strange insignia, it stands to prove that the best place to hide something is in plain sight. For this used to be the headquarters for the secretive society that Baxter Starlington's parents founded. If we walk down this back alley here, I reckon we can find a way inside. It's a little dark, but I... there's a table over here. Automobile infiltration. It's... it's my car. Penetrate forward motor plane. Um, pneumatic leaping accelerator throttle. Insert high charge accelerator throttle into injecting pneumatic throttle in ZX2 engine. Quantum lock onto landmarks. That's what happens. I always appear near a landmark. Después de todo, recoger basuestos a estos caballeros. Bien, son de prueba y pienso usarlos en todos mis camiones para que vean que Bernard Dom se preocupa por sus trabajadores. Por lo visto, mi palabra no es suficiente para ti. No sabes lo decepcionado que me siento. Mírame bien, te llevo a mi casa, te trato como a un hijo, te muestro todo mi negocio. Someone's, um, wow. Someone's taped over this tape. And then check out this exciting shot. These action scenes would be really neat if we knew or cared about what was happening. Back from my doctors. He said normally they can operate on a brain tumor, but this one is malignant. Oh. Come on, you're coming um, with me to my Come on, you. Uh, I think we should get out of here. Back to the car. I don't think this is Ann Arbor anymore. In fact, it's probably not even Michigan. It must have taken a wrong turn onto some kind of a island in the Pacific. Uh, let's go back. Oh wait. Guy at something. Look, ha, a lucky penny. I think we need all the luck we can get, especially going back to Ann Arbor, land of the parking meter. Come on, let's go to this door. And apparently the University of Michigan is here too. Oh. No, still not. Ah! Uh, it was a twist top. I was just weak. Apparently the college students only take up 2% of the population of the senior citizens though. 
Well, time to go. A part of the sidewalk, this US mailbox is a metaphor for Ann Arbor. Old, but still standing on all four legs. The bolts hold it together with strength of iron. Weathering from exposure to atmospheric elements, it paves the way to erosion. The never-ending weathering erosion. Ah, uh, wait. What am I talking about? How weird was that Dharma Initiative building? <laughs> Crazy. Oh yeah, an arbor is like a mailbox. If you put things in it, they'll get somewhere. Explanation.